Good morning. We have a couple of announcements to start us this morning. Uh, first, clearly all of our public events are postponed, but I do want to remind you we will have our backyard barbecue. We will have Rhonda Stoppy come and, and speak to us. We, we will have vacation Bible school. We just don't know when. So if you will be patient with us, we will reschedule those as soon as we can. And we're postponing that because we're doing our best to be a good neighbor and loving our neighbor. Also, I wanted to encourage you that we will be having the Lord's Supper, um, not this week, but next week. So if you want to go out and get supplies, if you want to get juice or a wine or crackers or bread, we will be taking the Lord's Supper together in a way we've never done it before. So go ahead and get your orders in for that. I must say it's great to worship with you. It's great to worship with you in a, in a new way, a way that we're all still getting used to. I have to say, I, I've been intimidated preaching before. The, the very first time I ever preached, it was uh, when I was a freshman in high school 25 years ago. I rechecked my math three times. It was 25 years ago at this very spot in this very church as a freshman in high school, I gave my very first sermon with Adam Curran. And we, we preached on the seven woes. And I remember I had this, this little lamp and, and almost caught the church on fire. It wasn't a spiritual fire. It was a, a literal fire. And I remember one of the high school girls told me afterwards that it was a pretty boring sermon. <laughs> But I was intimidated, and mainly I was intimidated because my, my freshman English teacher, Miss King, one of my favorite teachers I've ever had was here, and I, I just knew I was going to get to school on Monday, and she was going to say, you are grammatically incorrect here, here, and here. And so I was intimidated, but I must say that, that this is a different level of intimidation to, to speak into the camera, but I know that God is in control, and he's, he's blessing churches all over the world. We're, we're reaching people that we have never reached before, and we're so thankful for that, and that he's in control of that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I want that to be your verse this week, especially during this service. To not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. But to take a step back and say, God, we are coming here to worship you. We are, we are in our homes, in our living rooms, worshiping you because you are in control and you are good and you are holy. And I have to say, before we get into the musical part of worship, we had a difficult time with, with our worship team this week. We had to audible about three different times because... Either the, the musician or a family member was under the weather. But last night, our youth pastor and his wife, Sarah, stepped up in a big way. And they're going to be leading us in worship this morning. In fact, Sarah has been posting on Facebook Live every day a new song. A new song to, to bring glory to God and, and peace to you. There's something about music that does that, that just brings us joy and peace. So as we get into worship, I encourage you, if you want to use this time to pray, pray. If you want to use this time to, to sing by yourself or to sing with your family, stand up and make a joyful noise. If you want to lift your hands, if you want to sit down, we just pray that you be controlled and follow the Holy Spirit. Before we get into that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you hear our prayers, and God, let us never be weary of, of hitting our knees and crying out our hearts to you. God, we pray for those that are suffering with their health. We pray for those that have this virus, and we ask that you display your power to conquer this disease and this fear that is wrapped around it. We pray for our first responders, for the nurses, for the doctors, God. And for those that are at home, I would like to give you some Silence to pray for those by name that you know are first responders. Lift them up.
And Heavenly Father, we also pray for our missionaries. Lord, we as a church have Colin and Ronnie in our hearts and in our minds, and we're praying for them. But I want to give you a moment of silence to pray for those that you know that are on the mission field right now. And Heavenly Father, we pray that as we find ourselves in this new chapter of life, God, that we use it. God, that we are your hands and your feet to a world that desperately needs us, Lord. Give us the power that comes from you. Give us wisdom and how to minister to people. And we'll give you the glory for it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
And I'm blessed to be your pastor because I get to see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that most people don't. I have to say I've been so proud of our church. Between the emails and the phone calls and the text messages and the Zoom meetings to see how this church family has taken care of of not only one another but also this community. I want to encourage you to keep on keeping on. Our seniors are are not only calling one another, they're, they're calling everybody in the church. Members are getting food and supplies for each other and for their neighbors. Mothers are encouraging one another by giving each other lesson plans and posting on Facebook. I saw on Facebook this week uh, uh, the moms kind of uh, planned to, to, with sidewalk chalk, write encouragements to the neighbors, whether it was a verse or positive words. The body of Christ is working together in each and every one of you. And it's amazing because in this time, we're going through something that we have never experienced. I don't care who you are, it's a frightening time. Whether it's health-wise or, or financially or politically, it's a difficult time. It's frightening. And I hear a lot of people, especially Christians, saying that, that fear is some sort of bad thing. Fear is not a bad thing. It's okay to have healthy fear. We don't have to act like we're not concerned for for our parents. We we don't have to act like we're not concerned for those that are most vulnerable at this time because we love them. But I do want to encourage you to not be consumed by your fear. Because when I was really thinking about it, all fear is, is trying to predict the outcome. All fear is, is trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. You fear uh, for a loved one's health or you fear for your health. You, you fear for your financial position. You fear that you may lose your job. We fear things because we're trying to predict what this outcome will give us. But we as Christians can fear not because God has got this. Because we know that He is the Lord. And we know the outcome of our relationship with Him, with, with the Lord, is, is He has conquered death. He wins We win. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 through 16 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ be consumed in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms and hymns and the songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all of your anxieties, every one of them, cast all your anxieties on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And my wife's favorite, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then, then you will call on me and, and come and pray to me. And I, God says, will listen to you. You will seek me and find Find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, fear is predicting the future, but as as Christians, we know who holds our future. We put our fear in the Lord because our future could not be brighter with Him. Here's what the future holds for you who are in Christ Jesus. God has gone to prepare for you a place. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's got our back through this. We are His children. It's okay to be fearful. We're in a difficult time, but we're going to get through this. This is something that that I believe no one has experienced in our lifetime. It's okay to mourn. It's it's okay to, to be scared in these times, but I want to encourage you to not allow yourself to be consumed by that. Allow yourself to be consumed by the peace that comes from God. As scary as a time that we're in, I believe there's never been a better time in my lifetime for brothers and sisters in Christ 
to stand up and to show the love that he has given us, to forgive as he has forgiven us, to love as he has loved us, and to rely on him for our peace. I think a world that desperately needs that is looking on. As a, as a church, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark for almost two years now, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And today we're going to end that series with the, with the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. If you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 28, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to start in verse 16. Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples, they went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some, some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. How much peace does that give us? And you might be asking yourself, if, if we're ending the Gospel of Mark, why would we be using Matthew's versions of the Great Commission? And not, why not Mark's version? For many reasons. One, it's the most known. And, and secondly, in my opinion, it's the most clear-cut version. And third, Mark, uh, Mark has some questions on whether it was something that was added later, which we'll talk about in our small groups. For those that don't know me well, I, I grew up in this church. I started coming here when I was eight years old, and I love this church. And I, I want to encourage you that this church takes Jesus' last words to his disciples to heart. It's our church's missions. And one of the primary reasons that we exist as a church and one of the primary reasons that we exist as a Christian is that our desire to see men and women of all races and sexes and ages to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then to go, to be goers, to have this mentality that we're all missionaries. We all have this unique mission field that God has given us. For, for some, it's in Uganda. For, for some, it's in the grocery store. For some, it's, it's in our homes. For some, it's in the schools. But to be equipped to be sent out. When Jesus came, he established a new kingdom. A kingdom not defined by wealth and power, but of sacrifice and service and of love. And the claim is that, that Jesus is the king of this new kingdom. And so when he gave us this command, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. He leaves us with peace, and surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. In the Greek, which what Jesus would use, this, this word go was a command, a command to all believers. This word go is ironic today because the CDC and the, the president and the, and the governor and the mayor are saying the exact opposite. Stay, <laughs> hunker down, stay put, don't go anywhere. I don't want to encourage you to do that. But find ways, unique ways to go and to minister to your neighbor. To go and to, to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ to find ways to spread the gospel. I had never used Zoom two weeks ago, and I think I've used it every day since then. I'd never heard of it before. I encourage you to text your friends, your neighbors, making sure that everything, everybody is okay. Let them know your heart. It's a command for every, every follower. Go. And as a church, we want to encourage you to be a goer. Because the impact that the gospel has had on you and the way that it has changed you, our response is to tell others your story. To tell others the story of Jesus Christ. That I was, I was dead in my sin, but Christ, He died for me. He pardoned my sins by His sacrifice. And now, because of His blood, not only am I not guilty in the eyes of God, but He adopts me as His child. Not only uh, does he slam the gavel down and say not guilty because of the, the, the blood of, of my son, he says, I adopt you. 
And now we, we can go directly to Him. We can ask Him for wisdom. We can pour our, our heart out to Him and He listens to us and He cares for us. And as much as He's for us now, the Scripture tells us there will be a time that we get to be with Him face to face in paradise. And that's the gospel. That is your story. And what's your response? That's why we encourage our church to be missional. In fact, if I had to describe our church in two ways, the first way I describe it is we are a family. We love one another. We care for one another. We know each other. We know each other by name. We hold each other accountable. We, we pray for one another. We eat with one another. We protect one another. And we do life with one another. But we're also a missional church. And, and that's the, at the heart of who we are. We've spent so much time and effort here not focusing just inwardly, but more importantly, outwardly. Not just focus on the people that walk through the doors. But our desire is that when you, when you come to this place or when you are in your living rooms and, and being a part of this church through that, whenever you leave, whenever you go out, that you take the gospel with you. you use the gifts and the talents to a world that desperately needs the love of Christ. To share the gospel wherever God takes you. And I've been convinced this week more, more than ever that we have an amazing moment in time where people are listening. When people are looking for help, when people are allowing us to serve them. God has several people's attention right now. And we have the opportunity to show them the love of Christ. The love of Christ that's within every one of us. But we have a very small window of time and then it's over. And I'm not just talking about the coronavirus, but our life is a very small moment of time and it passes by so quickly. While I was writing this sermon, I could not believe that it was 25 years ago since I preached my first sermon here. And this last week I celebrated uh, my nine-year anniversary with my wife. I cannot believe it's been nine years. I met her when I was a youth pastor and we dated and we got married and we had our first house and, and we both changed jobs and I became a pastor and we moved to be closer to the church so that we could establish a place where we could impact the neighborhood. We've had three kids and it's... It's gone by like that. I'm so blessed to see Boone and Sarah lead worship. But then to see Scarlett pop up <laughs> and to start a song off in worship, it'll be like that before she's leading. We have a very small time to make our mark. God has given us all a job to do and He lays it out clearly in his last words to the disciples as the Great Commission. And we talked last week about how great it is that, that God gives us a part of the gospel, that the creator of heaven and earth, the perfecter of our faith, wants us to do his work. God doesn't stand aside and say, watch this, watch me do my work here. He says, join me. Join me. I've, I've given you gifts. I've given you talents. Now go. He gives us a part. But we don't have nearly the time that we think we have to make the impact that He desires. We have just a blip in history to make our mark, to take the message of Jesus to those that desperately need it in our neighborhoods and across the world. And then we go home. We go to that home that He has prepared for us and we pass the torch to the next generation. I want to tell you as a church, we greatly care about the Great Commission. As a church, we try to, to disciple you through scriptures and through our experiences to reflect God's character. To love as He has loved you, to forgive as He has forgiven you, to, to show mercy and grace as He has shown you mercy and grace. And to, give, and to use the gifts and the talents that He's given us. And for those of you that are, are worshiping with us this morning, today I ask you to pray. I encourage you to pray when you wake up every morning, God, what do you have for me today? Let's stop having the prayers of, God, I, I've got this to do today. I've got this to do today. I have no idea how I'm going to get this done. God, I need you to to what I'm doing. Instead, go to him first and say, God, what is it that you have for me today? God, what, what way do I fulfill the great commission today? 
And the scripture says, pray without ceasing. As you, as you go throughout your day, have that mentality, God, what is it that you have for me to do today? And secondly, I, I pray that you pray this prayer that we've been praying as a church from Ephesians chapter 3. We've adopted this as our, as our church's verse. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 says now, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God, do something so great to us that when we look back at what you did, the only logical answer is God. God did this. He's responsible. I believe that happens not because of good preaching. It doesn't happen because we are gifted and talented enough, but it happens because we realize our strength comes from Him. And when we hit our knees and pray, God, use me. God, what do you have for me today? I believe this happens when our, when our church leadership, when our church members, when our youth and when our kids are praying, God, do more through me than we could ever imagine for your glory. My desire for this church, my desire for you is that we pray like that. Pray with us, God, in this time that we have left. Do something so significant that when we look back, we know, we know that it was you. Father, help us to serve our neighbors as you have served us. Father, help us use our gifts and our talents as Jesus has used his. Help us to impact this community, to impact this city, this nation, and this world. So I challenge you, who have a relationship with him, go. Be a goer. Find a, a unique way in this time to be a goer. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't wait. Hit your knees now and pray. If, if, if you would love to talk to me, there is nothing more than I would love to talk to you about. I'd love to hear your story and pray with you. Please get in contact with me. Reach out to me. If you've never been baptized, that was the next step in this, was to be baptized. Jesus' last words, therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you've never been baptized, I encourage you to do the right next step. You might be asking yourself, how in the world can we be baptized when we can't get within six feet of each other? And this is the most creative way that I could find out to do it. We will have a dunk take here, and I'll stand six feet away and happily... No, we won't do that. But we will find creative ways to baptize if you want to be baptized. And know that this is going to pass. This too will surely pass. And if you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, if you have been baptized, be a goer. Let's go. Get in the game. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we... We thank you that you choose us, not to take a, a sit on the bench, God, but to get active and in the game, and you give us roles and, and responsibilities to reflect your son. I thank you that you, you give us gifts and talents to reach this world. Lord, help us love one another as you have loved us. Help us forgive as you have forgiven us. Heavenly Father, we we pray that we make an impact through you in mighty ways, ways that we couldn't even imagine. And we'll give you the glory for it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. God bless.